Let's revise the whole of AQA astrophysics. We're going to be talking about telescopes and telescopes use lenses. So we're going to be starting off with converging lenses that are used by telescopes. So telescopes actually collect light and the lens will have certain properties. We're going to start off with the principal axis, which is just this axis over here that I've started drawing in this color across here. So any ray that is parallel to this axis will actually end up being focused to the focal point. It's also known as the principal focal point and let me just draw that. It's just this point across here. The focal length is known as the distance from the central axis of the lens or the central line that goes through the lens to the focal point. That is our uh, focal length, typically given the symbol F. The uh, parallel rays are actually refracted through the lens and end up at the focal point. Let's see how virtual images are formed. First of all, if I bring an object closer to the focal length, so you can see that this arrow here, that's my object, is brought in closer than the distance of the focal length. I'm going to be drawing two rays. One of them will be from the object like so. However, this will then refract and go through the focal point as normal. Now, the other one will be going through the actual center line of the lens that we can just show like so. To show where my image will be, all I would need to do will be to extend those two rays. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one, then I'm going to extend this like so, and then I'm going to take this one here, and I'm going to extend it like so. There will be an image that will be formed at the point where those two lines meet and as you can see that this image is on the same side as the object. So this here is my object and this here is my image. To summarize with a virtual image, the image is on the same side compared to the focal length. What do I mean? With our real image, this was our object, and our image was here, whereas on the virtual image, which is this one here, it is the other way. So the virtual, the image is on the same side. It is not invert it. There's also a formula that will allow us to calculate the positions. So let's say that the distance from the object to the actual lens is known as u and the distance from the image to the lens given by v. The equation that links them together is known as the lens equation and that is given by 1 over f where f is the focal length is equal to 1 over u where u is the distance to the object plus 1 over v where v is the distance to the image. So refracting telescopes consist of two lenses. One of them is known as the objective and then the other one is known as the eyepiece. In the exam, you, you can also come across the word the eye lens. Okay, well, because we're looking at a very distant object, we can think of these objects essentially at infinity and the rays are coming towards the objective lens in parallel. They get refracted by the, they get refracted by the objective lens and they form a real image across here. 
The second lens, the eyepiece over here, is essentially a little magnifying glass and it will produce a virtual image in exactly the same way as, this, as we have discussed before, which will be larger, it will be magnified and will be able to see the object in detail. So this here is a virtual image. Now, an important property of the telescope is known as the magnification. This is defined as the angle subtended by the image divided by the angle subtended by the object. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say that this here is our object and for it to view this, so this here is our observer. You can kind of think of this as uh, essentially an eye, which is across here. Let's see if I can draw an eye. You have to imagine this here is an eye and um, the object will be a certain angle, typically a small angle. So think about the moon in your uh, view without a telescope. Let's call that theta O for the object. If we were to look at the moon through a telescope, the moon would appear a lot bigger. So let's say it will be about this big and this will subtend an angle which is considerably bigger and uh, we can call this angle theta i for the angle of the image. So let's use a different color for this one. So I'm going to pick yellow and this here will be theta i. Now the, mag the magnification, let's call it m, is simply defined as theta i divided by the theta o, which is the angle subtended by the object. There, all, there is also another equation that we need to know for the magnification, and that is in terms of focal length. This is illustrated just here on the diagram above, but we can essentially express it as a ratio of the focal length of the objective lens, which is f naught or f o on this diagram, divided by the focal length of the eyepiece, which is just f e on this diagram here. And those are the two formulas for magnification that can come up on the exam. Let's have a look at reflecting telescopes next. The first arrangement that we're going to be looking at is known as the Cassegrain arrangement. Now, this uses a parabolic mirror as one of the mirrors. So let's draw this. This mirror here is actually concave. Let's imagine that we have some light that is coming in from a distant object that is at infinity. The light is coming in this way. What's going to happen to it? Well, it is going to get reflected following the rules that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. It is going to do something like this, ending towards this region. The trick with the Cassie grain arrangement is to place a secondary convex mirror right across here. Additionally, there's actually a hole in our primary parabolic mirror. Let's see if I can draw this accurately. So somewhere around here, there's an opening and the light that has reflected off our secondary mirror here will actually be escaping through this hole. So let's just draw this across here. So this light gets reflected this way and this light here gets reflected this way. After the reflected rays have escaped through the hole, they will typically go through an eye lens and will be looking at the magnified image through on this side.
Let's compare refracting and reflecting telescopes. So in terms of the refractors, they uh, first of all suffer from something known as chromatic aberration. So the idea here is that different colors or different wavelengths, you can think of the colors simply as the wavelengths, are refracted by different amounts. Additionally, good quality lenses are very hard to, to make and they actually can get distorted by their weight. You can tend to only support a lens around its edges so by the sheer nature of the weight of this glass they can get distorted. Additionally the magnification is actually proportional to the focal length so if you're going to need a very large magnification we're going to need a very very large telescope. Remember the magnification is actually equal to FO, one of the focal lengths, divided by the other one. Well, in terms of reflectors, so a couple of different things that we need to mention. First of all, mirrors can be supported a lot better, so they tend to distort not as much. They're not just lying on, um, on their edges, so you could lay them out on the surface, support them on a surface, and you can have a much better or much less distortion. However, they can be prone to something which is known as spherical aberration. That is the, the fact that if the mirror is not perfectly parabolic or not perfectly aligned, the rays may not converge onto a single point that could create a blurry image. It is not just visible light that we use, we also use radio telescopes and infrared and ultraviolet telescopes. Now, what do I mean by radio telescopes? So first of all, they just use radio waves, which can be anywhere up to tens of meters. They have a very, very similar structure. So they have a parabolic mirror, as you can see in this image over here. And uh, because it's not visible light, but the data is just analyzed, they have, they're focused at a focal point, which is just an antenna. So uh, they work in, they're essentially spherical telescopes, but they reflect radio waves. So both of the radio telescopes and the optical telescopes and in fact all telescopes are maneuverable. What do I mean by that? That means that they can they can move around these axes to track an object as the earth is rotating or as the object is moving across the night sky. There is one major difference though. So as we said, radio waves are anywhere from uh, about a meter or less than that, all the way up to tens of meters. Whereas on the other hand, the visible light is between 400 to 700 nanometers. So this means that potentially the radio waves are over 10 million times longer. Now, because of that, if you're trying to create an image with a much longer wavelength, the resolving power of radio telescopes, of a single radio telescope, is going to be considerably worse than an optical telescope. However, there is a catch. The, you can link multiple arrays of telescopes, sometimes in different locations across the globe, and that will increase their power equivalent to having one giant telescope with essentially the size of the dish equivalent to the distance between them. And uh, even if they're in different locations around the world, um, AI essentially can be used to link them up. This is actually how the first image of a black hole was actually produced. So it is not just radio waves that we can use to build telescopes. We can also use things such as infrared, things such as UV and X-ray telescopes. The idea though is that the atmosphere actually transmits just radio and visible wavelengths and a very large portion of infrared, UV and X-rays are absorbed by the atmosphere. So if we were to build telescopes that work in the infrared, on the UV range, uh, they're often set up in high altitude balloons, particularly for UV and X-ray radiation or airplanes or even space telescopes. So for instance, the JWST that has been quite recently uh, a lot on the news, quite rightly so, is a space telescope, which is an infrared 
telescope. The infrared and UV telescopes are broadly pretty similar to optical telescopes, so they keep using a parabolic mirror. However, what do they actually focus the light on? Now, here lies the difference. So they typically use a detector, which is known as, as a CCD, which is a charged couple device. So it, essentially, it's a small chip that's been divided into millions and millions of individual identical pixels. So if a photon is to strike a pixel, then that would mean that an electron is emitted from there. Now, if it's emitted, this would change the charge of this pixel and uh, this is by the photoelectric effect by the way and this will essentially be creating a digital signal from that you can infer both the position and the actual intensity so for instance let's say that we've had a couple of electrons that have flown over from this pixel it will have certain intensity but then we will only have a little bit less intense signal if only one of them has flown out of a different signal out of a different pixel for the exam also we'll need to be able to make a comparison of the eye and a charge couple device the first time that we need to be aware of is quantum efficiencies so this is simply the ratio of the detected photons over the incident photons. For a CCD, this is really high, it's around 80%, whereas for the I, it's around 1%. Additionally, keep in mind that the CCDs can uh, obviously detect things like infrared, visible, and UV. Not X-rays, but infrared, visible, UV, but we can only detect visible light with our eyes. So that's a major limitation. The resolution is an interesting one. So the overall resolution of the eyes around sort of 500 pixels or so versus probably, depending on technology, these things do change every year, around 50 megapixel for a CCD. However, they're much, they have a much better, what is known as a spatial resolution. That is essentially the um, resolution required to tell the difference between how far different objects are and uh, they have a much better one over 10 times better one than the eye so they're much better for fine detail additionally if you're just looking uh, for the eye lens of an optical telescope you need no extra equipment when using your eyes but on the other hand if you have all the equipment and a uv telescope and things like that you can produce digital images. Additionally, you can look at potentially through things like uh, nebulae, for instance. So the, the next point from the specifications we're going to be revising are the advantages of large diameter telescopes. Now, in order to do so, we first need to introduce the concept of the minimum angular resolution. Think of it as the smallest angular separation for a telescope to distinguish between two points. So if our telescope is rubbish, those two points are just going to appear as a single point. If we were to get closer and closer and closer, this angle here will become essentially bigger. Additionally, um, we need to know that the collecting power, think of a telescope as a light bucket it's proportional to the diameter squared and this is because uh, typically um, you can think of it especially for spherical ones you can think of this part of the telescope where it is a circle and uh, of course the surface area of this is equal to pi d over 2 squared so this is where this really comes from what really what we need to introduce though is something which is known as Rayleigh's criteria and uh, that tells us that the minimum angular resolution let's call that theta as we have in this angle here is approximately equal to the wavelength that we're trying to observe divided by the diameter of the aperture that we are using.
So the diameter of the uh, aperture is essentially the diameter of our objective lens or of our objective mirror. So the larger the diameter, the smaller our minimum angular resolution. And in order to um, have as much detail as possible, we want to keep our minimum angular, angular resolution as small as possible. And now let's talk about the classification of stars. We're going to start off by classification by luminosity, which essentially is a measure of the brightness. Well, let's introduce the term luminosity, even though it appears a little bit later when we do Stefan's law. Well, luminosity is the total outward power radiated by a star. It's given by this equation, which we're going to look at in um, our next chapter. But uh, in general, it is just power. It's what astronomers call power. It depends on things like a constant and then multiplying by the temperature raised to a power of 4 and then the surface area. In general, the brighter the star is, either the temperature is much higher or its radius is much higher. It's just measured in watts. Okay, well, one way of classifying stars is by apparent magnitude. Now, this is a measure of the brightness of the star as seen from the Earth, which is really, really important. It depends on the luminosity of the star, its power, and how far away it is from the Earth. For instance, if I had kind of a small star, this here will have a relatively low luminosity, and this large star will have a higher luminosity. However, if the small star was much closer to the Earth, then it will appear a lot brighter. The first person to come up with a form of classifying star uh, was a chap called Hippoparchus, uh, who lived in ancient Greece, and he came up with a scale. The brightest stars were given an apparent magnitude of 1, and then the um, dimmest stars were given an apparent magnitude of 6. These days, we've replaced this with a far more sophisticated logarithmic scale. And in general, the lower the number, or the more negative the number, the brighter it is. And all these values below are taken or measured from the Earth on average. For instance, the Sun has an apparent magnitude of around minus 30. A full moon will be somewhere around minus 12. Um, Venus will be around minus for Saturn, around 0.46 on average. Polaris, the North Star, around 2. So you can see that the really negative numbers are very, very bright. And then the positive bigger numbers are very, very dim. Well, remember though, brightness is a subjective scale of measurement, and this is really, really important. Um, it depends on things like the distance, and you can have two measurements which would no, which may not necessarily be the same. Uh, for instance, if Venus is a little bit closer to, to, to the Earth, it will appear brighter. We also need to know about this equation right over here, which gives us the ratio of two intensities as measured from the Earth, and that is equal to 2.51. And this ratio here, or this uh, difference here, m1 take away m2, is the difference in apparent magnitude. Well, let me give you an example for this. We have the Sun, which has an apparent magnitude of minus 2.6832, and then the Moon, oh, what's happened here? Let's get rid of that. The Moon, which has an apparent magnitude of minus 12.74. How many times brighter does the Sun appear than the Moon in our sky? Well, because I'm going to be uh, finding out how many times is the sun brighter than the moon, in this case, I'm just going to take uh, the index 2 to relate to the, the sun. So I2 will be the intensity of the sun, and I1 will be the intensity um, of the moon. Well, then this equation will tell us that this ratio will be equal to 2.51 raised to the apparent magnitude of the moon, which is 
minus 12.74, so minus 12.74. Then we're gonna take away a negative uh, number, which is the apparent magnitude of the sun. So that'll be minus 26.832, which is equal to 2.51 raised to the power of minus 12.74 plus 26.832, which is equal to 2.51 raised to the power of plus 14.09, and this will be a very large number. So if in our calculator we do 2.51 raised to this power, we're going to get a number well over 400,000. So around 432,500, um, up to around four significant figures. So the sun is this many times brighter. The relative intensity of the sun is 432,500 plus times brighter than the moon in our sky. Now for the next portion of the spec, we need to first of all define some units that we're going to be using quite a lot. So these here are units. First of all, we have the astronomical unit, which you'll probably come across at some point. It's known as 1 AU, and that's around 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. It's defined as the average distance from the Earth, here's the Earth, to the Sun. Because one meter as well is not useful, very useful as a as a measuring uh, as a measuring unit, as a as a meter stick across the universe. The universe is far bigger than that. We're also going to need to define a light year. And that is the distance traveled by by moving at the speed of light for one year. Let's calculate how much that is because the speed of light is constant. One light year is going to be equal to speed multiplied by time, which is going to be three times ten to the eight times 365, times 24 days, each of them has um, 60, uh, times 24 hours, times 60 minutes, multiply by 60 seconds, and this will give us a grand total of 9.5 times 10 to the power of 15 meters, and this is one light here. So the next thing that we're going to be discussing is the unit of distance, which is known as parsec, and that is very much connected with the parallax angle. Now, let's start off with the basics. Imagine that we have the Earth across here, we have a nearby star, and we have a background of fixed stars. Now, they're so far away that their relative position in the background does not really change as the Earth is moving around the Sun. Okay, so let's say that we want to measure the distance to this star. If the Earth moves across the Sun in six months' time, then the Earth would have gone across half of its orbit and will be able to go to this side. Now, the position of the star in the night sky would have changed by this angle here. Half of that angle is defined as the parallax angle, and that is very, very small. Normally, it's a few, sometimes even less than an arc second. And one arc second is defined as 1 over 3600th of a degree. So it's a very, very tiny number. So we know what the distance for between the Earth and the Sun is. We've just mentioned that. It's one astronomical unit. Then if we know this and we can calculate this in, in meters, then we can use some simple trigonometry if we just measure the parallax, parallax angle with telescope. This is the exact technique that is used to estimate the distance to nearby stars. Now, the parsec is this distance across here. One parsec is defined as the distance at which one astronomical unit subtends a parallax angle of one arc second. Oops, let's just add one arc second in this definition 
here. So this means that if this angle here is one arc second, if this here is one astronomical unit, then this distance here, typically given the symbol d, will be equal to one parsec, one pc. Okay, well, let's estimate the, uh, or let's calculate the value of one parsec using some simple trigonometry. So I'm going to use the fact that the tangent of one arc second is going to be equal to its opposite divided by the adjacent. So tan of 1 over 3, 6, 0, 0 degrees will be equal to the opposite, which is just one astronomical unit, 1 AU. And then we're going to be dividing that by the distance in parsecs. Well, remember 1AU, we've already calculated that value, so we can just rearrange for D, which will be equal to 1AU. Now, let's convert that to meters, which was 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11. Then we're going to be dividing that by the tangent of 1 arc second, which in uh, degrees is 1 over 3,600. Hundred, and then up to two significant figures, we're going to get that this is about equal to around 3.1, let's call it, I think 3.8 is the accepted value, times 10 to the power of 16 meters. And this here is equal to the uh, amount of meters in a parsec. I have a very, very detailed video about this and I'm going to link this in if you want a little bit more detail on this topic. As I said, there's a problem with absolute magnitude and that is that it depends on the distance. So in order to really understand how bright a star is, if it were a fixed distance away, we need the absolute magnitude. So this is defined as the apparent magnitude that an object would have if it were viewed from a distance of 10 parsecs away. And we can find that using this formula over here, where m, take away capital M, so the absolute magnitude, by the way, is typically given the symbol capital M, and that's just this, the apparent magnitude is this, and that is a logarithmic equation, is equal to 5 log, the distance divided by 10. Now, important that this distance has to be in parsecs. Well, let's apply this equation here to a little example to make sure that we really understand this. We have a galaxy, there it is, of around 8.8 .8 times 10 to the power of 5 parsecs away, and it has an absolute magnitude of negative 19. Now, will it be visible from Earth with the naked eye. Now my plan here is to find its apparent magnitude then how, and then see how it compares on the scale. So uh, I'm going to use this equation here and I'm going to just rearrange for m. I'm going to find that m will be equal to 5 log d over 10 and then plus the absolute magnitude which will be equal to 5 log and now the distance is 8.8 .8 times 10 to the power of 5 then I'm going to be dividing that by 10 and then to that we must add the absolute magnitude m which is minus 19 like so. If we were to put this into a calculator we're going to get an answer of around 5.72. Well if you guys remember the Hipparchus scale, um, that went up to around 6 at the lowest end. So we can assume that things that are as that are between 1 and 6 and lower will be definitely visible. So if it's 5.72, we can say that the object, whatever it is, uh, galaxy, asteroid, supernova, it could be a whole bunch of things. Um, the object will be visible, but very dim. And now let's have a look at classification by temperature. First of all, we need to recognize the black body radiation curve, and that is illustrated in this figure right here. Notice something interesting. 
if the temperature is very, very hot, so this here is the temperature of a body of around 7,000 Kelvin, then it will emit a relatively low wavelength. We can actually demonstrate that with my digital ruler, so we can see that the wavelength for 7,000 is around here. Well, the predominant wavelength, the one which is most likely to be emitting. Um, for a body at 6,000 Kelvin, well, the wavelength will be a little bit bigger. For the one at 5,000, it will be a little bit bigger still. In general, the lower the temperature, the bigger the wavelength, it seems. So this will be an inversely proportional relationship. So, the most dominant wavelength, known as the peak wavelength, is often written as lambda max, and uh, this will be proportional to a constant, I'm going to call it K for now, divided by the temperature. Another way of writing this law is that lambda max times the temperature is equal to the constant k. Now this value k um, is actually, let's write this down as lambda max times the temperature is equal to, the value of the constant is 2.9 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 3. What do you think the unit of this will be? Well, it's wavelength measured in meters multiplied by temperature, and this has to be measured in Kelvin, otherwise it will not work. So it will be meters Kelvin. Now it's really, really important not to confuse this with millikelvin, so I'm going to write it out in words underneath. It's meter Kelvin. Your equation will not work in degrees Celsius, so I'm going to underline the Kelvin here. I'm going to show you a really, really um, important trick as well. Uh, if we're comparing two objects and we have just one unknown, we can also always say that lambda max 1 multiplied by T1 will be equal to lambda max 2. 2 multiply by t2. Let's say we're trying, let's say that we have the predominant wavelength of one star and its temperature, and we have the wavelength of the other star, but we need to find the uh, temperature of the other star, then all we need to do is just directly rearrange this equation uh, for t2 or any other unknown uh, that is required. So in this portion of the spec, we tend to combine, we tend to get a combination of those three laws. We have Wien's law, which we've uh, just introduced. Let's just write it one more time for completeness. So the peak wavelength multiplied by the temperature is uh, going to give us a constant 2.9 times 10 to the power of minus 3 uh, meter Kelvin. We have Stefan's law, which we've briefly talked about, but that is all about the total outward radiated power by the star. Sometimes in uh, other books, you may come across this written with the symbol for luminosity L, but the total power, which is going to give it P now, is equal to Stefan Boltzmann's constant, which has a value, multiplied by the surface area of the star, multiplied by the temperature raised to the power of 4. Now, typically in this equation, in the A is the surface area of a star or a different object, which is going to be given by 4 pi r squared. Stefan Boltzmann's constant just has a value, it's 5 point um, six, seven times 10 to the power of minus eight, and its units are going to be watts, m to the minus two, k to the power of minus four. You also have the intensity law, uh, which will give us the intensity at a distance away from the source, uh, which is typically taught when we study waves, but intensity is equal to the power divided by 4 pi d squared, where d in this case will be the distance from the star to the observer. So let's just call it the distance from the star, or whatever other object it is that we're dealing with. And typically we have to make a combination of those three equations.
And let's apply this to an example problem. So first of all, we have the peak wavelength emitted by the sun is around 550 nanometers, but a surface temperature of around 6,000 Kelvin. Calculate the surface temperature of another star with a peak wavelength of 400 nanometers. Okay, so I'm gonna use the good old technique that lambda max times t is equal to a constant and don't even need to use the constant value so i'm going to say that i'm going to say that lambda 1 t1 is equal to lambda 2 t2 so a typical trick by the way of not included in this question would be to give you the uh, temperature in celsius make sure that it's in kelvin please and uh, we can directly rearrange for the surface temperature of the second star which is T2, which will be equal to lambda 1 T1 divided by lambda 2. So T2 will be equal to uh, 550 nanometers times 10 to the power of minus 9 multiplied by the uh, surface temperature of uh, the sun, which is around 6 thousand kelvin then we're going to divide that by 400 which is our lambda 2 times 10 to the power of minus 9 notice that because it's a ratio the nano prefix cancels we shouldn't even write it just to save time in this case okay and if we put that into a calculator we're going to get around 8300 kelvin for the temperature okay now that we have that number for part two we can actually calculate its radius because we're given its luminosity now remember the luminosity is the total power of the star and uh, we can use the power equation which is stefan's law uh, which is going to be the constant multiplied by the area of the star multiplied by t to the power of four to um, calculate its radius well Remember, the surface area is just equal to 4 pi r squared. So in this case, we're just going to be looking for the radius. And we can just directly rearrange for that. The radius will be given by the square root of the power. And then we're going to be dividing that by the constant. And then 4 pi. And then... Uh, what have we got left? T to the power of 4. Okay, well, let's uh, plug in some numbers here. It's going to be kind of a long expression. Uh, the luminosity of the star is 5.0 times 10 to the power of 27. Then we're going to be dividing that by Stefan Boltzmann's constant, 5.67 times 10 to the power of minus 8. Uh, that's this guy here, multiplied by 4 pi. And then the temperature of the second star that we've just found was 8300. Very typical mistake for getting to raise that to the power of 4. And if we plug this into a calculator, we're going to get around 1.2 times 10 to the 9 meters for the radius of this star. Let's talk about spectra for a moment. The electrons can only exist in a set of defined energies around the nucleus. I have a really detailed video about this, including absorption and emission spectra, which I'm going to link in the description, which I go over this in a lot more detail. Now, the most negative state is known as the ground state and that is typically given n is equal to 1. Sometimes in a question if we have to do a calculation um, they will be given in uh, electron volts just make sure to convert those to joules. Now there's a set of visible lines that are emitted or a set of missing lines when photons are absorbed. And the reason for that is because if an electron goes down in energy level, so let's say that we have a particle at n is equal to 4, and then it goes down to n is equal to 2. Then a photon will be emitted and the energy of that photon will be given by hf where f is the frequency it will basically correspond to some color
Okay, the opposite will happen if a photon is absorbed, and that's how an emission and an absorption spectra is formed. Now, there's a set of lines which are known as the Baumer absorption lines, and they correspond from a transition from n is equal or greater than 3 to n is equal to 2. In other words, um, it will be a spectrum, a set of lines that are, gonna, that are going to correspond from n is equal to 4 to n is equal to 2, from n is equal to 3, and then from the higher energy levels as well, which I've not drawn here, back down to n is equal to 2. Okay, now the next thing that we're going to be talking about are the spectral classes of stars. In this table, we need to remember the characteristics for. So the spectral classes are given names, uh, O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. And you can use your favorite method of remembering this. They're going to correspond to a different color. They will be going with the spectrum, so we're going to start off with blue, and then we're going to move into blue-white, then white, and then yellow-white, and then uh, orange, and then finally red. Remember, red has the longest wavelength and hence the lowest temperature. It's kind of useful to remember that our sun is sort of yellow-white, and that corresponds to around Five, between 5 and 6,000 Kelvin. Well, the surface temperature is close to 6,000. That's a different story. Uh, but we're going to need to find a way of remembering these values. In terms of the absorption lines of the Baumer spectrum, uh, different things will be absorbed, which will tell us what's, uh, essentially what the main composition of the star is that I've listed over here. So we have things like helium, hydrogen, ionized metals, ionized metals, neutral uh, metals, and um, in in the um, stars which have the lowest temperature, it will be neutral atoms. Another way of classifying the stars is using this diagram here, which is known as an HR diagram or a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. So, what are the main points? First of all, on the y axis we have absolute magnitude, and um, this tends to range from around minus 10 at the highest. Remember, a high negative absolute magnitude means a very bright object, uh, so something like a blue giant, for instance. Whereas, on the other hand, we're going to have some very faint objects with an absolute magnitude of around plus 15. Another highlight is that the temperature increases the opposite way, and this is really, really important. We need to remember the ranges of the scale, so uh, it'll go somewhere from around 50,000 or so Kelvin uh, up to M um, from the scale, so that'll be what, around 2,500 Kelvin. The position of the sun is right around here. Notice that right at the top we also have the um, spectral class classifications of stars as, we've as we discussed in the table up here. So O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. And then here is the position of the sun. Okay, well, what will happen to our sun as it's evolving? Remember, when the sun loses its hydrogen fuel, it will eventually turn into a red giant. The red giant's region is right across here. And after it becomes a red giant, it will end up being a white dwarf eventually. So it will move to this part of the diagram. So how is a star actually formed? Well, we have an interstellar dust cloud that tends to collapse under, uh, under tends to collapse under gravity. The gravitational potential energy decreases, the temperature increases, and around 10 million Kelvin. We don't really need to remember the number. The nuclei, the hydrogen nuclei, starts to start to fuse into helium. And the word fuse here is critical. This is what actually gives the energy of the star. What is the evolution of a star that is similar to the Sun? Well, our Sun will turn to a red giant, as we've just shown on the HR diagram, and then um, it will eventually turn into a white dwarf with a planetary nebula.
a much more massive star will undergo a very different life cycle. So it will turn to a super red giant, so a little bit further left on the HR diagram, but then it will um, cause one of the biggest explosions in the universe, which is a supernova. This is not up to scale. These things have a huge absolute magnitude that outshines an entire galaxy. Depending on the mass of the star, then it will turn either into a neutron star or a black hole. What are the characteristics of a neutron star? Well, it will have an incredibly high density. Uh, we're talking of the order of 4, sometimes higher, times 10 to the power of 17 um, kilograms per cubic meter, which is very, very similar to the density of the nucleus itself. So we have essentially neutrons that are as tightly packed as they possibly could be. Um, they have a very small size. Um, they're of the order of literally around 10 miles, so shall we just say around 10 kilometers or so. So something of the mass of the sun that's been squashed to the, to the size of a small city. In terms of a black hole, the really, really interesting um, object in the universe, uh, they're so incredibly dense that the escape velocity is higher than the speed of light. We can also find the uh, Schwarzschild radius for the formation of a black hole. And the way we do that is by setting the uh, kinetic energy equal to the gravitational potential um, energy. So um, the, that's how we find the escape velocity. Should we just call that VE? where m is the mass of the object that's being turned into a black hole and then we're going to be dividing this uh, by the radius and i'm going to call this radius rs where s stands for the schwarzschild radius so m is going to cancel out and then um, i'm going to say that the escape velocity is actually equal to c and just rearranging for the Schwarzschild radius, we're going to get that this will be equal to 2gm divided by the escape velocity squared. But this is now just c, and uh, this will be c squared. So this here is the formula for the uh, Schwarz, see if I can spell it correctly, child radius. If uh, we compare something to the size of this, it is going to form a black hole. We also need to mention type 1 supernovae, which happen with stars, which have roughly the same mass and the same brightness curve. They can be used as standard candles to determine the distance to objects. This actually became critical for our study of the universe. Their absolute magnitude um, compared to time looks something like this. It's very, very high initially. It tends to vary a little bit but um, on the, in, the, in the way it's drawn, but very high initially and then gradually uh, drops down over days. Uh, you may be asked to add in a unit, for instance, in an exam, or they may try and trick you with the unit and find a mistake, uh, etc. So it's important to know that uh, this happens over days. They're so bright, actually, that they can even outshine almost an entire galaxy during this process. Okay, we're going to talk about the Doppler effect next, and that is the relative change in the frequency or the wavelength if the source is moving with respect to the observer. So delta F in this equation is the change in frequency, and uh, let me just write that, and F here is the frequency as measured in the lab. So this is really, really um, important. Okay, so this is equal to V, which is the relative speed between the source and the observer. We don't actually know which one's moving, so I'm just going to call it the relative speed. And the C here is the speed of light. Uh, we can define a quantity which is known as the red 
shift uh, given the symbol z and this is equal to exactly the same way the fractional change in the wavelength but we also get a minus sign in front of here well let me apply this to an example we have the wavelength of an element is measured as 500 new uh, nanometers in the lab the same signature wavelength is measured as 12 nanometers longer in a red shifted galaxy calculate the recession speed okay well we just all we need to do is uh, just rearrange for v and in this case this will be equal to the negative of delta lambda over lambda times delta c okay so we know that our change in wavelength is going to be equal to 12 we know that our original wavelength was equal to 500 like so we multiply that by the speed of light and we find a very high recession velocity for this galaxy and this is a technique that will allow us to calculate the speed of moving objects the Doppler shift can also be applied to the uh, study of binary stars and uh, most of the stars actually out there are binary so let's say that we have a couple of stars that are orbiting one another so at the moment when they are approaching us um, if they're approaching us then uh, this means that they will be blue shifted whereas this one here uh, depending on the position, if it is going this way, it will be moving away from us. And if that's the case, it will be red shifted because it's receding. Now, if we measure the recession velocity of all the galaxies out there, we find something absolutely remarkable. Look at this straight line correlation. On the y-axis, we have the velocity, the recession velocity in kilometers per second. And on the x-axis, we have the distance in megaparsecs. We can see that the speed of the recession of the galaxy is proportional to its distance from Earth and this here is known as Hubble's law. If we were to apply some y equals mx plus c analysis and if v is on the y-axis, if the distance is on the x-axis, then our gradient is equal to Hubble's constant h naught. Now, if we do a little bit of maths, we're going to figure out that H0 will actually have units of speed over distance. Well, speed is typically measured in meters per second. Now we've got it in kilometers per second, but we can just speak in general. Then we're going to be dividing that by distance. So the overall base unit of H0 is 1 over seconds now this means though that if we do 1 over h naught then what we're going to get is something with units of seconds with units of time and this here means that we can essentially estimate the age of the universe and this here is a very important formula that the age of the universe is approximately 1 over h naught, assuming a linear expansion. Now, how does that work? Well, the galaxies are receding, meaning that they were a little bit closer before, a little bit closer before, a little bit closer before, a little bit closer before. And at some point, we reach a time where all the galaxies were occupying the same region, i.e. this is the concept of the Big Bang. Now, how can we actually calculate this time well observations show that the value of hubble's constant is somewhere around 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec well let's convert that to si units the way we're going to do that is first of all we're going to multiply by 10 to the 3 which is the kilometers part and then we're dividing by an entire megaparsec. So this negative one applies to uh, both the mega and the parsec. So we're gonna divide by 10 to the six. 
And also one parsec, we're gonna to need to convert that to meters, and that was around 3.08 multiplied by 10 to the power of 16 meters. And if we put this into a calculator, we are going to find a value of Hubble's constant in SI units to be around 2.26 multiplied by 10 raised to a power of minus 18 s to a power of minus 1. Now from this value we can actually calculate the age of the universe which is just 1 over the value so it'll be 1 over 2.26 times 10 to the power of minus 18 and if we were to put that into a calculator we're going to get around 4.42 times 10 to the power of 17 seconds. Now that is a lot of seconds, but what is it in years? So in order to find this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide that by the number of seconds in a year. So 365, um, each of them has 24 hours, each of them has 60 minutes, times 60 seconds. And if we put that into a calculator, we're going to get around 1.4 times 10 to the 9 years. And this here is approximately the age of the universe. Please note that this here actually assumes linear expansion only. So this is an approximation. It's very, very close to the real number, but we need to say that it assumes linear expansion. So the universe is currently expanding and it is cooling. Actually it is expanding at an ever increasing rate due to something that we don't understand known as dark energy. Um, but back in the early universe as when it was expanding um, eventually the, the universe cooled down enough for the um, for the photons to break free during something known as the re recombination period when the electrons actually formed atoms and loads of radiation was created. So the this radiation has been continuously been stretched with the expansion of the universe and is now known as the cosmic microwave background radiation and we've measured this and is one of the big observational pieces of evidence for the big bang so this radiation was initially released as gamma rays but has now been stretched to microwaves and it accounts for about a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. Here's a picture from the WMAP Space Telescope of that radiation. Another observational piece of evidence for the Big Bang is the relative abundance of hydrogen and helium. There's a lot of hydrogen and a lot of helium in the universe, more or less around 74% hydrogen and around 24% helium and a couple of percent for all the other stuff. Now, in the early universe, it was hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium via nuclear fusion. And we can actually predict by comparing nuclear physics to the relative abundances of each of those substance, substances, the proportions of how much this should be now, and this matches the observational data, um, once again confirming uh, what we know about the Big Bang Theory. And finally, we're going to revise briefly quasars, which are the most distance measurable objects. Uh, they were actually discovered as bright radio sources and they have the largest redshifts possible. They're these uh, emissions um, as things are spiraling supermassive black holes. Even the size of the solar system with many, many, many billions of solar masses. Really, really interesting objects. Additionally, we're going to revise the detection of exoplanets. So these are planets outside of the solar system. They tend to be very hard to detect because they, well, they orbit bright things, they orbit stars, and also they're very, very tiny.
So if we're going to detect them, there's two methods. One of them is a uh, known as the Doppler shift method, and it looks for variation in the spectrum of the star the planet is orbiting. So some things might be getting a little bit blue shifted and a little bit red shifted and then vice versa. The change is tiny though. It almost accounts for a small wobble of the star. And this is because the uh, star and the planet actually orbit the same center of gravity. The other method is known as the exoplanet transit, and they measure the changes in the apparent magnitude that dips in temporarily over time. If you can work out the ratio of uh, the changes in intensity, you can actually calculate the um, the radius of uh, of the of, of the planet pretty effectively. I actually have a, um, a question solution on, uh, on a problem like this. It's uh, from one of the Oxford past, pa past papers, if anyone is interested. Okay, guys, well done. You have revised the whole of AQA astrophysics. This is probably one of my longest videos ever. So rather than watching another video, you should first take a break. But then after you take a break, uh, why don't you revise some paper one particle physics? This video is right over here. Thank you very much for watching.